We're good. Hello, everybody. I am Beth Weatherford. I am the school psychologist here at Harper Park. This is my, I don't even know how many years here, eight years maybe at Harper Park, and my 26th in education. Um, so this is? Hi, I'm Ashley Olson. I'm the school social worker here at Harper Park. Do either, do any of you, I know you have a sixth grader. What grade is your child in? Six. Six? How about you? Six. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> how about that? This is a presentation that um, we'll go over. It does have some good information. The Miss Olson's mm -hmm. going to go over some things. But this is actually a presentation that all eighth grade students um, receive in a lot of chemical mm -hmm. schools. And then again in ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth. So this is a nationwide program <coughs> that is really to promote, um, it's really to to teach our children how to spot signs that maybe a friend's in trouble and then to tell a trusted adult. So it's not really about them dealing with the friends, it's teaching them the skills to then tell a trusted adult because they cannot take on that themselves. And we find that a lot of times they do. I will say this program actually has been, it's warped throughout the years, but it started almost, I wanna say almost, 20 years ago, to be honest, um, I actually started it with two other psychologists, and then it's, um, we started at one high school in particular, and then it's kind of come across, and we've, we've partnered with some of these companies, and then it's now a nationwide um, program. So um, today, really, the topic is going to be um, how to spot, you know, prevention, what we're teaching our children, and building coping skills. Good morning. Hi, come in. I'm Beth Weatherford. I'm the psychologist here. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm a mom. Hi. What grade is your child in? Six. Oh, all of you sixth graders. So great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, actually, sixth grade people. <laughs> <laughs> By eighth grade, they're like, whatever. <laughs> um, so, really, this is our agenda. And I'm going to go through some of this. Um, so, really, we want to know why Why does suicide happen? Okay. We, t you know, we have kids. We hear about it, we, we know it's in our system, we hear kids say it all the time, but they don't mean it. So our job is try to figuring out, we always err on the side of caution, clearly, but there are other indicators too. So the majority of times when um, suicide does occur, that there is an underlying mental health condition. Um, typically it's like an untreated depression, but it's there. Um, the access to, you'll find kids that are drinking, doing drugs, they're more likely to start having these feelings. And then when they talk about the isolating and withdrawing, that's where we start seeing that our friends start saying, well, you know, my friend's not really hanging out with us as much. You know, they're, they maybe they choose a different friend. Um, they're definitely withdrawing from things. As parents, you're gonna see that maybe they're not as actively engaged with their friends. Maybe they don't wanna go to their friend's house when they used to. Um, their grades could start declining. Come on in. Sorry. No, Come in. Fine. You're fine. You're fine. That's stuck in the office. No, it's all good. Um, there's a loss of hope. So there's feelings of hopelessness that nothing can go right. Nothing is getting better. Um, access to guns is a pretty big indicator in terms of research shows that a lot of guns are not secured properly in homes. And many times when students are feeling suicidal per se. It's usually a pretty quick feeling. It's intense, but it does go away. But when you have an access to a firearm during that time of that crisis, it's a lot easier for them to grab it and do it. Whereas if they don't have that access, that feeling can pass. You know, other indicators can get in that way. So that's always one of the first questions we as mental health teams ask is, are there guns in the home? Um, there are many, 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 unfortunately, occasions within Loudoun County where guns were the means to suicide. Um, so that's a really big indicator. And then obviously the thoughts of suicides, they are intense, but they are fleeting. It's very rare that it's constant. It's, um, it's fleeting so that we can start seeing the signs of all the other things that are going on. Um, so really, our goal in schools and his families is to prevent it. So here we have Sources of Strength, which is a nationwide program where we have seventh and eighth graders who are trained 
in all the strengths that we have. And they are promoting strengths versus everyone looking at all of the bad things. We're really trying to push out what are your strengths? You know, everyone has weaknesses. It's always really good to see. You know, you can easily say, here's the bad things, but it's not as easy to say, oh, these are the good things that I have going on in my life, right? Like a gratitude journal. These are things that I have that are working well for me. So that's what Source of Strength does. So we are including that with all of this. So in terms of preventing suicide, we're talking about all these things with um, treatment if there is a mental health condition, uh, and then connection to peers. That's really important. A lot of kids felt very isolated after COVID. Um, I know it's been a couple years, but there are still some who do feel isolated. They've missed sometimes that, those years of really forming those friendships. Um, so we're trying to get kids more connected. When kids are more connected to their communities and their families, they're less likely to hurt themselves. It's, it's a statistic, it's a fact. When you are part of a community, you're thinking about others, not only about yourself. Um, feelings of hope, obviously providing access to the guns. Healthy habits, exercise, eating right, access to doctors. These are all things that can um, help prevent suicide. So when we do this presentation in eighth grade and then in high school, this is the acronym that we use, is ACT. So when we are teaching them to acknowledge that there are signs of depression or suicide in a friend. So we'll go over those signs of what they are, the things that they may see, such as giving away items, feeling hopeless, all those things that we see about um, suicidality. So they're going to acknowledge that there are those signs. And then we teach them that they're gonna to care to tell a trusted adult, that it's not stitching, you're not breaking your friend's trust because they say, I don't want you to tell anybody. Well, yes, I have to tell somebody. You know, We even go through that as the adults, that when they say, I don't want my mom to know. I'm like, well, your mom needs to know. Your mom's gonna to wanna to know, or your dad's gonna to wanna to know. And I guarantee that they're not gonna be mad. They're, they're gonna be scared. And if they're scared, it could come out as being perceived as angry or something else, but Everyone's writing, we want to know with these feelings. So we are really encouraging our friends to acknowledge that something's going on, care about your friend, to tell a trusted adult. So we'll go over who's a trusted adult. So we always make sure that I, that everyone has a trusted adult. They can write down their names, and we, if they don't, we always give the option, well, there's me, you know, there's Ms. Olson, there's their counselors. There are lots of people in this building that are trusted adults, and through this program, we also have not only this parent component, we have a teacher component. So all the teachers have to go through this so that they know this is happening in our schools, right? So they know that if a friend comes to them, you know, a student comes to a teacher and says, I have these concerns, they then know to come to one of the mental health professionals in the building. So not to take it on themselves either because um, you don't want this. So here are some of the warning signs. We acknowledge that these are some warning signs. What we talked about, the big changes in behavior withdrawing from friends. This to me in middle school is one of the biggest things of the changes in behaviors, the sleeping, um, some of the pain. Middle schoolers are very impulsive, very impulsive. And that is the concern for us when they may have some of the suicidal ideation or this anger or they see no other way out. They developmentally can't think, you know, three steps ahead. So they're just so impulsive in the moment. That's why we take it so seriously, and that's why we want them to tell about, even if they're just saying it, oh, I want to kill myself, right? That we still want to know. So we, as professionals, can look at that, and then also inform parents, because that's that's not an okay thing to say, so we need to teach our kids also that that's, that's not something that you should be saying. Um, so we see a lot of times that kids will be sleeping less or more, um, there may be some drinking, drug use, overwhelming pain, talking about suicide, and then some of it's just pure impulsivity. It was a bad thing, a bad choice, um, you got in trouble, you just can't see any further, and you just jump to that nth degree, right? So um, we tell the kids that we need to tell them that it's okay they're feeling that way, and that we, as parents and adults, care about you, and that we're here to listen. And we're not here to judge. You know, if you these are your feelings, and we validate these are your feelings, and then from there we, we move on. So um, we always say, don't keep a promise a secret because it's never a secret. When you're talking about harming yourself or somebody else, it's not a secret to be kept. Um, and we always say, you know, it is worth like if you think your friend's gonna be mad, 
it's okay. They can be mad. And I said, they can be mad at me all they want. It, you know, as long as their life is safe, I don't care if they're angry at me, right? Um, as adults, that's our job. And just as parents, you know, it is our job to really focus in on some of these signs with our children. And it, sometimes it's hard because, I mean, I have two kids and they're in middle school and high school. And I'm like, hmm, something off today, you know? But sh at the same time, your kids aren't gonna tell you everything. So it's things that you've gotta really kind of gauge with friends and family. And it's not an easy one kind of thing. Um, so a lot of times, kids will come to you that they're worried about a friend. So this is what you can do, is listen about your child's concerns and encourage them to seek help. Um, contact their friends directly, parents if, if you know them. Um, you can always contact the school. We've had people contact us before. Um, and obviously immediately, if you're concerned about their safety, call 911 and then reassure your child that they did the right thing telling you. Um, it happens quite frequently where people do call 911 and that's okay because then the police will come over and do a ball check. They just want to make sure that everyone's safe. Um, so these are things that you really can do if your child comes to you um, worried about their friend. And 988 is a texting. I just always remember 911, please, 988, texting for safety, and they can help get you where you need to be. There's always a pediatrician, school counselor, and that. Um, this is hard, managing your reactions. Um, you don't need to be an expert of all the opinions. You can give yourself to be human. I mean, it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be angry. It's okay. Um, a lot of times people are not comfortable with this topic. We're a lot more comfortable with it because we're trained and we do it all the time. It can be a very uncomfortable topic to talk about because it's scary. It is a very scary thing. Um, so you never obviously want to keep a secret. Um, and you may need some friends to talk to, either a spouse, a friend, somebody that you can then go to because it's a lot when you start <coughs> maybe hearing that your child is feeling this way. You know, you need to make sure that you have supports too. Um, and then we really talk about the perfect, oops, sorry, the protective area. And I know you're going to talk a lot more about some coping skills and stuff too. But, um, you know, we are encouraging that connection with school. I'm really glad we're doing the clubs this year after school on Wednesday, Thursday. They're free. Um, it's great to see the kids running around the building after school. Mm -hmm. They're enjoying it. They don't want to leave. It's fun. Volleyball, all of, like, we have the sports. We, we have a club pretty much for anyone right now. Um, so we do want that strong connections. And even if, your kids not athletic just making sure they're into something right connecting with others somehow um i don't it's we want kids to play still at this age like middle schoolers one of the best things that we see sometimes in my room and our the three of us our room the oasis is we actually have toys we have legos we have cars when we see middle school kids come in and start playing with that it is like miss harper and i will look at each other like this is fantastic because they're actually engaging in imaginative play which a lot of them forget to do, and it's okay, it's age appropriate. These are 11, 12, 13 year old kids in this building. They need to be playing, they need to be active. That's why we still go outside at recess for PE. I mean, for lunch, they go outside at least to run around and get fresh air. So, and it's important to let your kids know that you're always ready to listen. Um, I mean, I know personally, I get busy, um, I work, you know, my kids have sports, my husband, like we're all working, we're all busy. And I have to remind myself to take that time to make sure that my kids are okay because we're all just busy. And I personally find the best time to find out anything that's going on in my kids' lives is driving in the car, driving to um, sports or school or anything. And I really love it when they have friends in the car because they forget you're there when you're driving them around and you start hearing all that stuff. So you're like, okay. So I think it's still really important too that you do know who your your children are hanging out with, right? Who their friends are. It's important. And it builds a community. Um, so coping skills are things that help people deal with unpleasant feelings. We all have them. We all get some sort of anxiety, whether it's significant or not. That feeling of anxiousness is okay. It's normal. It helps us actually do the tasks that we need to do, right? But there are times that we have unpleasant feelings and hard times. So it is really important, as I said, to stay active. We do a lot of writing. A lot of the kids will come into our room and they're having problems verbalizing it. So we'll take out a journal and he'll be like, here, why don't you write down what's going on? Sometimes it's just easier to get that done. They write about it. Um, 
I suggest too, if you find that they, your kids don't want to talk to you, writing a journal back and forth. Like they'll write something about their day, then you write back to them, then they write back to you. So it's that constant dialogue. Um, kids love to talk to their friends, and that's important. Listening to music, um, they love it. That's one of the one, number one things that kids will say when we say, what are some of your coping skills? And they'll say listening to music. Um, it might not be my preference, but they enjoy it, and it can help calm them. Also coloring, writing, reading. It's okay for them to escape what's going on, right? That's okay. To not think about it is a good thing. To not obsess about it, right? Go ahead, read a book. You know, go somewhere else in your brain. That's okay. Um, so here's some talking to your teens or preteens. Um, it's not something you can just start. You know, it's not something you say, Art, do you know anyone that's feeling this way? You know, you have to have that conversation starting about it. Just kind of starting about feelings of depression or anxiety. Um, a lot of kids are really embarrassed, they're uncomfortable about talking about these things. Um, a, the kids that we see too a lot, they're afraid of disappointing parents. Like that's their number one thing. They're afraid, my mom's gonna be mad at me, my mom's gonna be disappointed me, my dad's gonna be upset. I'm like, no, they're just gonna be worried. They're gonna be worried and that's okay, they should be worried. Mm -hmm. um, teens need to know that you're not gonna overreact, that you can handle it, that you believe them. The big thing is that they're not in trouble and not alone. That's, that's one of the big things I hear is that they're afraid, I'm gonna get in trouble, I'm gonna get in trouble. You're not gonna get in trouble. You, there might be some consequences to your actions, but that's a natural consequence, but you're not getting in trouble, and that they're not alone. So that's really important for them to know, because a lot of times they do feel alone. And it's okay to ask. Um, people can be really uncomfortable with the topic and have difficulty um, asking, and I mean, I ask, are you feeling this way? Do you have these thoughts? <coughs> Is this something that's reoccurring? How long have they been? Like it, we're not tiptoeing around the issue, we're actually asking them, and you'd be surprised with some of their answers. And talking about it is not going to have a child start having those feelings. That's a big misnomer. If, if they're talking about it, there's some thoughts. If I ask them, they're like, no, me asking is not gonna put those thoughts in their brain. They, they don't have that. So, um, you know, let them know that you see that they're pain, that you're not afraid and that you're there for them, and there are a lot of professionals out there that can help them. But I think it's really important to start that dialogue with your children, even if it's not your child, it could be their friend, right? Um, that's really the gist of all this, like I said, is they're good, the eighth graders are learning about this, so we want them talking to their parents. We want them to say, I'm concerned about so-and-so. And we have had kids come in to say, I'm concerned about my friend, or, you know, if something happens and you hear about the community, they'll come in and tell us. Um, so teen-led meetings, let your teen set the agenda. I've never done that, but I would love to. Um, sometimes it comes up in a movie or TV show, you can always talk about it. You know, have you ever, do you know anybody that's ever thought about this before? You know, what, what would you do if, you, if that happened? Um, out for a walk, taking a drive, just having little mini conversations, not a sit down, just kind of in passing, um, and make yourself available on their schedule, which is really difficult, I, I do know that. Um, and I will say too, you know, if you don't want to talk to me, you can talk to your aunt or your grandma or you know our neighbor, or another trusted adult. Sometimes they may feel more comfortable sharing that way. Um, so we're teaching them to look out for the signs, Try to build those coping strategies, those positive sports, which is where um, our source of strength comes in, and then to act. Um, that we need to tell you this is up, right? Okay. Um, and there's oh, this is actually a nice caregiver page that talks about clips from the program. It talks about things you can do as a trusted adult. So there's some really good resources. There's some really good resources there for you. So that is the overview of what we're teaching our children in eighth grade, but we're still having the <coughs> conversations with our children in the earlier grades. This is just so you're aware as a parent what your children will be saying in eighth grade. Anybody have any questions? It's a lot. Yes? Um, you said this starts in eighth grade like formally yeah. in a setting. Um, we've already seen this sort of behavior in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Why? Is there like some sort of reason why you guys don't start until eighth grade? You know, I will say it's at our admin building level down. Originally, we only started in like ninth grade, and that was it. Like, we did just ninth grade. 
and then we did ninth grade, then we did 10th grade, then we did boosters. And we really didn't start this middle school until like two years ago. Yeah, two years. Yeah, two years. But the conversations are done in sixth grade in terms of with their counselor or in PE with healthy activities and with sources of strength. It's just they, some, they don't get this. I don't know if they don't have the development ready for it yet, but we, yeah. we know that there are these thoughts already. So they've already had some yes. interaction. With yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. What yeah. we really push in all grades is the having the trust of the adult. Um, and if you, know, if you don't ever feel safe or you feel like a friend doesn't feel safe, what do you do, who do you go to? So we kind of talk about it more broadly. Okay. And then in eighth grade with this um, training for the eighth graders, it's more specific, um, especially because in that age, they start to feel like they can be little therapists for their friends. Yep. And we really want them to know that's not okay, not appropriate, and it's not healthy, right? Even as an adult, I might be a therapist for other people, but I shouldn't be a therapist for my friends. So what do I do in that situation? So we try to empower them of, you might think you can handle this on your own, but <clears throat> it's not okay. And you shouldn't have to be the savior for your friends. So eighth grade is really when they're like, oh, I'm mature enough, I can handle this on my own. Um, so I think that's really why we yeah. teach the act. Yeah, um, no, it's great to know that you are coming up with the Yeah, 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 definitely, so yeah, that's great. absolutely. Because we know it's not, it doesn't just start to happen in eighth grade. Would you like to attach to this yes, right now? Yes, I will. Okay, so this next bit is very in line with what we're already talking about. So, okay. Back up so you can look at it all what you're saying. Now I can put on my Merry Christmas you all have. Yeah, I saw that. Today. I was like, you know what, I probably shouldn't wear it for a Oh my gosh, I know. <laughs> I know. The good thing is not Wednesday because Wednesday is onesie day, and the adults in the building participate just as much as the children. It's no fantastic. way! Oh, oh yeah, I already God. have one now. That's hilarious. about these things but also some tips for us as parents because this can be a stressful time of year for us as well <laughs> so um, these are going to be some tips to beat the winter blues okay so why are we even talking about the winter blues I'm assuming everyone in here at least heard this term if not we've all experienced it <laughs> at some point in our life okay um, so more than half of people uh, living in places that have four consistent seasons experience the winter blues, um, which is a mild depression. It's not technically a depression. It's not in the DSM. It's not a diagnosis, but it's, you know, kind of a lack of motivation. You have lower energy. You don't really want to go out as much. That's pretty typical. But in about two to three percent of those populations, it's more severe and significant, um, and that's seasonal affective disorder. So we're going to talk about both. Um, and its acronym is SAD, appropriately. So when I say SAD, that's seasonal affective disorder, okay? And women are about four times more likely to be diagnosed with SAD than men. And I thought this no man with picture was really um, <laughs> accurate, especially with like how I felt this morning when I was really yeah. hoping for a delay. <laughs> okay, so winter blues versus sad what's the difference so 
Like I said, the winter blues, that typically always happens during winter, colder months. Um, you might feel sad, you wanna stay home, but really you're still able to function, okay? So an example of this could be maybe you decide to cancel some social plans and you're like, oh, I just cannot go out this week, I have low energy, I don't wanna go out with my friends. But when you stay home, you still watch a movie, you make some popcorn, you're hanging out with your family. So maybe there's still you're still able to function you're still able to find some enjoyment in your life, right? Um, and maybe the next day you can still go to work, talk to your coworkers. Things are pretty typical. Um, winter blues can also be related to if there's an external factor going on, like maybe you've lost a family member during the holidays, and so you're just feeling it really intensely during that time. That is more of like the winter blues. Especially with the holiday season, there's a lot of stress sometimes, a lot of pressure on us to create this picture-perfect um, holiday season, and that can just add more stressors and make you feel things a little bit more intense. So, seasonal affective disorder, on the other hand, this is when there's a more prevalent pattern. Um, onset is always in the fall and winter time. So, this can look like um, you're losing interest in many areas of your life. Okay, it's a more global impact. It's like um, at school, at home, at work, with your friends, with your extended family. You don't want, your kids don't want to play video games anymore. They always want to do that, or suddenly they always want to sleep. And a lot of these things are hard to see and notice sometimes because teens can be up and down normally, right? That's typical for them, but, um, if you've noticed either in yourself or in your student like huh this time of year they always really get really down really low and it's really hard to engage with them they don't want to participate in family activities that might be an indicator that something bigger is going on um so sad is a major depression um it's in the dsm it is a diagnosis there's specific criteria that are met to get that diagnosis um, and it's definitely significant. It's not something to just shrug off and say, oh, it's just, it's just winter time and I just feel really low. And I know I can make it until spring. I know that there's a lot of adults that feel that way. You're like, okay, I know I feel this way and I'm just gonna hunker down and I'll get through it because I know spring's coming. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that and why maybe we shouldn't do that. So this is one of my absolute favorite phrases to use. Um, it guides my practice and what I do, and it's what is predictable is preventable. So if we know winter's coming, if we know that these feelings are very normal and typical for either us or for our kids, that means it's preventable. This statement is super empowering to me um, because it means we have power to do something about this. We're not just, you know, sitting here experiencing it and there's nothing we can do. There's things we can do. Okay. Um, so, in this instance, if you or your kids are struggling with winter blues or even more serious conditions like SAD, what we model to our kids can be extremely impactful. So everything we're about to talk about, it's great if you're encouraging your students to do this, but it's also really important for us to model this for our kids. Modeling is one of the best techniques to teach. Um, and that's what we always try to do here at school is model the behavior we want to see in our kids, model the conversations we want to see. And so as a parent, if you can model these things, it'll encourage them. Um, one example of this is kids always, not always, very often we'll have students say, my parents always on me about being on my phone and they're on their phone all the time, mm -hmm. right? So that's a very simple thing. But <clears throat> if it's something else like, oh, you need to get outside, and you're always on your uh, computer games, or you're always playing video games, but they see you not going outside, they see you staying on your phone or working on your computer. Um, for them, it doesn't feel fair. Whether or not we understand, like, okay, well, I have to work, and I don't need to go outside, mommy's fine, right? What, I've, what they're seeing is not always reality, but if they see us modeling some of these things, it's really, really helpful. So I say all that to say what we're about to talk about, if you can do it with your kid or even do it on your own and be like, hey, why don't you join me on my walk today? That is a great way to engage your kid with all this. <clears throat> okay, so here's some tips and tricks for the winter blues, okay? Number one, sunshine, okay? <laughs> Seems obvious um, and also like there's nothing we can do about it, <laughs> okay? Because I know a lot of us will get to work when it's dark and we come home when it's dark. 
Um, any little thing you can do, if it's opening the blinds, um, if you're able to go outside for a little bit, and also sun lamps. Um, I laughed at sun lamps before, <coughs> and then I um, had babies and got depressed, and my <coughs> doctor said, get a sun lamp. It sounds silly, but it really works, and it does. So, sun lamps. If you are someone that is always not seeing the sun in the winter, that's a really easy thing to just have on your desk or to show your kids, and that, that's a, another way to show your kids, hey, I'm taking this seriously. And vitamin D is really, really important. Okay, get in outside despite this terrible gross weather, okay? And the cold, <laughs> it's so good for us. And we know all of these things, but it helps to remember, and all of these things have been pulled from research and from studies, so it's not just, now oh, let's try this and see what happens. We know that doing these things will help you to feel better, okay? Um, so even if it's just for 15 minutes, okay, that is super significant. Um, maybe you just do it once a week on the weekend and you say, okay, whole family, we're bundling up, we're going up for 15 minutes. And people might grumble and be upset about it. But if you build that routine as something that the family just does together, they might get on board. Okay, drink lots of water, okay? It's the holiday season. I know we want to drink some other things sometimes, but um, it's important to remind ourselves that alcohol is a depressant. Okay, and so sometimes people say, oh, I've got to do this to get myself through the holidays. But staying hydrated truly is one of the best things for your brain and for mental health. Um, and just be very aware and cognizant of how you're treating your body during this time. Um, so plan ahead. Again, this is what's predictable is preventable, right? So we know winter's coming. We know that it lasts a long time here in Virginia. Like, sometimes all the way through April, okay? So maybe try and plan some things for your family to look forward to beyond December, beyond January. It doesn't have to be things that cost a lot of money. If you wanna plan a trip, that's great, kudos to you. Can I come? But it can also be like, okay, the family, once a month, let's choose a family activity to do. Be very intentional about it, especially because a lot of kids aren't in sports right now or they're not doing as many activities with their friends outside. So if you plan ahead for the next two or three months, some activities you can do each month, you just know there's something to look forward to, something to remind your kids you're, there's something you're doing as a family, something to look forward to, invite their friends, have sleepovers, you know, whatever it is that you as a family feel comfortable with. But we know it's happening, right? So what can we do to help make it a little bit better? So also when we talk about planning ahead, if you are thinking in your mind, that sad might apply to you or to someone in your family. If this is something that you struggle with, don't wait. Don't wait until it's January or February and you or your kid are really struggling to talk to your doctor. Do it now. If you're like, hmm, I think that there are some warning signs here with me or with my kid, call your doctor, call the pediatrician and go talk to them like this week, you know. There's no reason to not. If you're concerned, get them support. Let the professionals help you decide if it's sad or if it's just the winter blues, right? Um, the worst thing that can happen if you go is you lose your copay, right? Maybe they say, ah, oh, this isn't that significant, but keep an eye on it. That's much better than having a really long and hard winter with your kids where it might get even more significant. Okay, laugh, socialize. Again, these things seem really um, obvious, but I think people forget Right? And again, with the planning ahead, maybe you think, okay, let's rewatch our family's favorite show. Right? Let's start over with The Office or with Modern Family or whatever it is that you guys like to watch as a family. Um, play games. Bring back the board games, right? Our kids forget how to play board games. So do things intentionally to try and get your family laughing and having fun together, okay? And again, they might roll their eyes at you and be a little disengaged, but if they're like, okay, this is just something my family does, I promise you they will get into it and they will look forward to it if they know it's coming. Trying something new. We have lots of free time now in the winter because there's not as many sports and activities like we said. Get a new hobby, a new book, encourage your kid. Or maybe you can say, hey, I really want to read a new book. What do you like? Can, can you and I read the same book right now? 
Um, and depending how old they are, I know there's a lot of sixth grade parents in here, so maybe your sixth graders more willing to like do things with you. Um, but read a book together, watch a show together, do something that they love and just like be fully into it. You can also ask them, hey, teach me how to play Fortnite, right? Kids love it when their parents try to play a video game and you're terrible at it, and, but they love it, right? So do something they like and then you're with them, you're spending time with them, they feel more comfortable, only good things come. Okay, turn up the tunes. This is research backed. Um, and in the past few years, there's been a lot more research on this that playing upbeat music literally changes your brain chemistry and it actually makes you feel better, okay? So whether your family celebrates Christmas and you play Christmas music or you just wanna listen to what your kids are listening to, like Ms. Weatherford said, even if we don't love it, but Again, I had to listen to Taylor Swift. Oh, you're lucky. All the way to Weston and back, because it was my daughter's 16th birthday, and she got to choose what she wanted. So we listened to a lot of Swift music. Yes. <laughs> and it's just showing long. them that, I mean, <coughs> that's Excuse not me. terrible. No, it's not terrible. <laughs> it could be worse. I know it could be worse. <laughs> oh, I know. But it's just another way to show your kid, hey, I'm, I'm interested in you, and I'm interested in your life and that makes them feel more connected to you. Do you guys know who your kids listen to music? Do you know who they are, like what their bands are? Because I thought I did too, and then I had my son choose, mm. and it was a YouTuber I'd never heard before. Ah. So we listened to different music there, and I was like, oh, oh God. <laughs> yeah, it's the little things that really tell you a lot. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Okay, and the last part is um, tell your support people for you. Um, if you are concerned about yourself, or about your kid, make sure that the other people around you are aware, whether that's um, a partner or a grandparent, or if they have a babysitter, neighbors they're connected with, just to have extra eyes on them and on you to say, hey, I'm, I usually struggle during this time of year and I'm trying to be more intentional. Can you keep me accountable, right? So if you say that to your best friend, like, hey, you know I like to cancel a lot, can you really challenge me on that? Or if I do cancel, can you make sure we reschedule? Or, and that takes a lot of bravery to acknowledge that you're struggling or that your kids might be struggling, but um, acknowledging this with other people kind of brings out into the light so that you can um, really do something about it, right? If we keep it hidden and we only tell ourselves that it's okay, I can handle this on my own, I mean, research just shows us that that's not effective. And that typically, um, if you're really struggling with mental health and you're not sharing it, it's almost impossible to deal with on your own. So the more people you can share with that you trust and will support you through it, whether it's for you or your child, um, is really, really beneficial. Okay, this is one of my favorite tips that I didn't put on there because I felt like it needed its own slide. <laughs> Think like a Scandinavian, okay? Um, my husband's family is from Sweden. So we talk about this a lot, but it's also from Denmark, Norway, all these countries, okay? So in <coughs> these countries, um, people view winter as like the best time of year, okay? Something to be enjoyed and not endured. So um, they embrace it instead of resisting it. Whereas I feel like a lot of us are like, oh my God, winter's coming and the snow and the slush and the rain most likely, you know, which is terrible and blah, 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 the sun goes away. Okay. They view it as, oh my gosh, we get to um, go skiing. I mean, they probably have better winter weather than we do, but we get <laughs> to sure. stay and spend time with our families. We get to get cozy, drink warm tea and fun foods, right? So they really have a mindset shift. And um, a huge part of mental health research right now is about mindset shifting. And it's increasingly finding that it's not that hard to shift your mindset and that you can really, in a very short period of time, change your brain chemistry and the connections in your brain to think differently. And this is another thing that we can try to model to our kids. So if we wake up, it's terrible weather outside, and suddenly like, oh, I really don't want to go to work today, and it's terrible, and you know. But you're allowed to feel your feelings. But maybe if you show your kid, man, the weather out there is really bad. I can't wait to wear my fuzzy socks to work, right? <laughs> Little things, this should show your kid that you're trying to find the little positives that do come with winter time. Okay, has anyone heard this word before? Mm -hmm. It's pronounced hygge. Okay, it's from Denmark, but it's it is centuries, centuries old. This word, um, and this is what it means. Okay, it's an atmosphere of warmth, well-being, coziness, 
and you feel like you're at peace and you're able to enjoy the company of others, okay? So Huga is like the whole culture of Denmark. They've kind of like totally grabbed onto this. It probably also helps they have like free healthcare and stuff, right? So they yeah. can just be happier. Seriously. <laughs> but Huga is their way of life, okay? And so there's, it's just everyone feels Huga in the winter time. So what does that mean? You've got your candles, your soft lighting, your string lights cozy socks, sweaters, PJs, okay, all these things might seem like, okay, cozy socks and soft blankets are not going to cause or, or cure my seasonal depression, right? You're probably correct. However, if all of these little things are building up, they're just protective factors to help with those winter blues and potentially with someone sad, okay? It just helps to promote it, okay? Um, having hot cocoa, cider, Acknowledging that there's extra time to learn a new hobby or a new skill or maybe have like um, my my brothers, I almost called him my husband, that was really creepy. My <laughs> brother's family and his wife are so into books and so they in the winter time they do a book challenge and whoever reads the most books gets a little prize at the end of the winter. So it's just encouraging these little fun things in your family. And the last one, it's extra time with your loved ones, okay? And this is Middle school is the prime time to build these connections with your kids before they get to high school and they will get more independent and they will push away. It's gonna happen, it's developmentally appropriate. But if you spend the time and energy in middle school really solidifying your relationship with your kid and they get to high school, they're gonna be independent but they're gonna keep coming back to you. They're gonna know that parents, caregivers at home are their safe place, their safe person because you've done all of this work building that connection with them, right? It's normal for them to push away. It's not you, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so these are all the little things, but at the end of the day, you've done all the things, you've, you have all this stuff, and either you or your kid are still really struggling, that is probably an indicator that they might be dealing with sad, okay? And that's okay. It's very normal, um, but it is, a major depressive disorder okay so you do want to talk to either your pediatrician or if you already have a therapist for you or your kid you can get them in to see their therapist um, one thing that I do a lot in this role as a school social worker is help families get connected to therapists in the area I know it can be extremely hard people have long wait lists um, but especially during this time of year it's important to, if you're concerned at all, call someone now or get connected with someone now. And if you need help with that, you can always let me know and I can assist. Um, so this is just kind of showing, if you have had, you or your kid have had mild symptoms that have lasted more than two weeks, like every day for more than two weeks, that's something to pay attention to. Um, and if you've tried these activities, if you've tried to get your kid out, you've tried to, you're making sure they're drinking enough water, they're eating well, um, they're connected to you or to their friends, and you're still noticing these symptoms, um, that is when I would really recommend talking to either their pediatrician or um, a mental health provider, okay? And again, it's not something to be scared of, but what's predictable is preventable. Right? If we can do something about it, let's do something, even if it's more mild symptoms. Okay, so we've talked about these things. Um, and remember, winter blues are normal. If you're feeling low energy and like you don't have the strength to plan all these activities, that doesn't mean that you have sad, it just means that you're a parent of children <laughs> in middle school, which is tough. And it's winter time. It's okay. It's okay to be low energy and have the winter blues. Um, but again, plan ahead. And I would talk about this with your family. Like, hey, I went to school today and there was a pair of coffee. This is what we talked about. Because your kids, if they've never heard the term winter blues, it might really freak them out if they feel this way. Right? And so you can say, hey, you know, I kind of feel really low and really sleepy during this time of year. I don't really want to do stuff. Did you know that's really normal? And you can say, I want to do some things as a family to help me feel better. And we're all going to do it so that we all feel better, right? You don't have to put it all on your kids. Um, but if you engage with them too, it'll be more effective. If it's like a whole family project almost of like, we are going to beat the winter blues this year, right? And if we can't, we're going to get help so that we can do it next year, right? 
So again, my favorite thing, what's predictable is preventable. We know it's coming, winter's coming, the sad feelings are coming, we want to sleep, we don't want to go outside. How can we shift our mindset? Because it's simpler than we give ourselves credit for, right? We have power here, we're not powerless, which I really love. I think that was all I had. Um, I've put on here our information, of course, if you wanted to reach out to us, but also the all of the counselors. If you are concerned about your kid um, or you have a question about something, you can always email any of us and we will connect with you. You, know, you can even say, hey, I'm worried about my kid at home. Can you let me know how they're doing at school? Like, are they connected to friends at school? Or have they ever come talk to you? You know, and of course we have confidentiality, so we won't share the nitty gritty. Um, but we can let you know what we're seeing on a global scale and let you know if we have concerns too. Okay, does anyone have any questions about anything I just talked about? When you say um, you can help find, because uh, it is a long list, for yes. example, I go through my insurance, yes. and uh, I, I've been trying to find, I would say, personality catered yeah. uh, mental health provider. I haven't had much luck, yeah. um, especially, you know, at being Monday through Friday in mm -hmm. their school. Um, so I'm finding that if I do manage to find someone, yeah. it has to be through telehealth. Yeah. And the girls do okay with it, but I don't think that that's what they're wanting to experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that that piqued my interest. I'd like to have more. Yeah, them. definitely. Just um, come see me after. I'll get your name and stuff. Um, because I have you know connections with some providers in the area. Unfortunately, a lot of people only take, they're out of network, mm -hmm. but uh, more and more insurances are working with patients to, if you provide them a super bill, they'll reimburse that if someone's out of network. I would definitely check with your insurance first, and again, I can talk to anyone about this more thoroughly, but um, because it's just, insurance is not providing to therapists a living wage, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now more and more therapists are just we're not taking out, um, insurance. So that will open your possibilities if you're willing to do out of network, but of course then that requires you to be able to have that cash up front, and a lot of people don't, especially during this time of year, and that's totally understandable. So I'm more than happy to talk to you about that, yeah. Anything else? I'm curious, yeah. um, what would make you all decide to want to do this include the sixth grade parents in, in this conversation? I, I know she was asking um, about it earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it, are you here as, as providers in the school? Are you seeing more issues that maybe you think this would be beneficial? Well, we always, all of our parent coffees are always open to all parents of any grade. So um, we decided, because we know that Beth's piece that she did at the beginning is usually shorter, like 15, 20 minutes, we said, okay, well, what is applicable to everybody? Um, and that we could tack in at the end and it's related and so we thought about the winter blues. Um, but yeah, I mean we see all of these issues across all grade levels. Um, they see it in elementary school as well. Um, just the nature of the world right now, post-COVID, you know, a lot of people are struggling with mental health. Um, um, on Friday we got a phone call from the principal, um, something about language uh, and folks, students not necessarily being kind to each other. And my first um, thought when I heard her message was, does this have to do with some of the current Middle East situation that started to spread through campuses now in high school as well? It looks like it's entering middle school. Was that part of it? Um, I don't think it's specifically about the conflict happening in the war, but because um, we, it's every year. It's been getting worse and worse. And it's, it's all kinds of Anytime there's and stuff done like that that other children can hear, the administrator is mandated to send out those messages. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of vague at the same time. It's oh. always yeah. Vague. <laughs> they're, they're never yeah. Gonna, they can't no, give no. detail. They're told what to say, but yeah, we do have a, a new racial slur and hate speech protocol that's been the past two years. Yeah. So it's a very specific step by step. What we do as a staff to react to whatever happened, and then the admin has to send that out to let the parents know that we had to deal with an issue involving racial slurs or hate speech. I get it too from my kids' voice. Yeah. I don't know, it's like, yeah, they, you'll never know exactly <coughs> unless your child's involved. So, yeah. 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 Y
So it does have <laughs> But that's a good talking piece at home. Yeah, um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We wear stuff in the hallways all the time. Yeah, when I get one from my kids' school, I'll say, do you know what happened or what this is about? Most of the time, they're like, I have no idea. Um, but we can then talk about you know, why this is a big deal and why why does the principal have to inform all families of, of this type of thing. Well, thank you guys for yeah. coming. We really appreciate your time. Appreciate all the information. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.